the immense enormity, the, the infinite nature of God's love for us. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, inasmuch as the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on that judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, And they spit upon him, and took the reed, and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, and put on his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. What? 
king would die at the hand of a Roman. Messiah, move it. <laughs> Let's go. Who will save you, king? Who will step up and stand the gap for you? Today you will die. your cross fit you king Jesus of Nazareth this will suit you nicely your blood will stain this cross king no savior will save you you are mine For 2,000 years, we have looked back at the cross, that symbol and reminder of the gruesome death that our Savior experienced. The enemy planned for the cross to be the end. From all appearances on that crucifixion day long ago, it appeared that the enemy had won. Through the night, through the mock trials, past Pilate and Herod and Pilate again through the scourging of the Romans the abuse the shouts of crucify him all the time just outside the city walls of Jerusalem stood the hill called Golgotha the skull On the hill was the place of crucifixion where the cross would be stood for all to see. For six hours, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, would hang on that rugged tree pouring out his life's blood so that we might have hope. 
the end of those six hours, the Savior was taken off the cross, defeated, dead, no longer to be a worry to the Pharisees and the religious people of the day. The Roman government would no longer have to worry with the insurrections of this one teacher from Galilee. As they took the body off the cross, they cleaned the body quickly, wrapped him in linen cloth, and carried him to a nearby tomb, placed his body lifeless, without breath, without heartbeat, placed that body in the tomb, rolled a stone over the face of the tomb and sealed it forever as if Satan were saying, we did it. It is over. Not really remembering the words that were said from the cross. As they took him down, the cross stood and for 2,000 years the cross has stood. Some wear it as jewelry as a lapel pin or on a chain around our necks or dangling from our earlobes or on a bracelet or a t-shirt or something. We even stood a 100 foot tall cross in our parking lot for the world to see. There's a cross in our baptistry. We use cross and, and the nativity simultaneously at Christmas. Today, standing in the foyer at the center of the building that everyone might see is the cross. A constant reminder. For years as I've stood at Easter services and Palm Sundays and the days leading up to Easter telling the story of the crucifixion, I would describe in quite graphic detail the horridness of the crucifixion. I'll allude to it this morning, but I don't want to talk about that as much as I feel the Lord imploring me to speak of the cross. Just the cross. I believe that today the cross stands before us with the declaration of what it means, the significance of the cross and the actions of that cross, <clears throat> the activity of our Savior on the cross. I believe that he makes a declaration to us today. I love the cross, which is a peculiar statement because it is on the cross that my Savior died where he was gruesomely, terribly, awfully punished, nailed to a cross. But without the cross, I, we, would have no hope. It was God's plan from the beginning. The Savior has been taken down. The cross is now empty. But it still stands. We see symbols. We see reminders. Especially during this season, we consider the cross and what the cross declares for us. In that scene you heard, it was a recording of an event we held here a few years ago. We called Jerusalem, large choir. We included other churches to help us with the scenes and the depiction. We, we built the city of Jerusalem in the pastures in front of the church and folks dressed in biblical era clothing and and we tried our best to show pictures and have the sights and sounds and smells of Jerusalem. 
and the gruesomeness and that recording was one of the Roman soldiers forcing Jesus up the hill of Calvary. He'd been beaten within just moments of his life, abused, whipped with the cat of nine tails with 39 strikes from that device, that evil, wicked device, spat upon as was read and cursed and mocked and abused. And he made his way up the hill. Likely they laid the cross on the ground and laid him on his back on that cross, his back which was filled with flesh that had been torn away with that evil device, the whip and his raw back bleeding profusely from his body. They laid him on the cross and nailed him there driving spikes large enough, three spikes large enough to hold the weight of a human being on that cross and then stood the cross and dropped it into a slot in the ground and it thumped and his body jerked and pulled away from the cross and and the pain shot through his veins and coursed through his body from head to toe. And the gruesomeness was so terrible. The people gathered around a crowd of people, the Pharisees and those who hated him, screaming curses at him. The Roman battalion, those soldiers who were griping and complaining that they were in Israel to start with. They hated the Jews and everything about Israel. And Then we had the, the small group of people who had followed him from Galilee, maybe some of his disciples even in the crowd but crowd walking along the side of the city walls on the Damascus road between Golgotha and the city walls as they were walking they looked up and saw this gruesome terrible sight and mocked him and spat toward him and they were disgusted by him when only five days later the entire crowd was shouting Hosanna to the son of David Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Messiah. And only an hour before they nailed him to the cross, the shouts and the cries from the crowd, how fickle we can be, how quickly we can turn. The crowd gathered together and cried out, Free Barabbas, crucify Christ. The voices were loud and many. They were storming that place and they screamed as he carried his cross along the Via de la Rosa as he was going to the place called Calvary as he was walking, carrying, stumbling. Simon had to come along beside and help him to carry his cross. They took him there. They had beaten him to nearly the end of his life. He had done nothing but heal those people. Where were the dead who he had raised Where were the blind who could now see? Where were the deaf who could hear those shouts of crucify? Where were all of those that he had touched and fed and blessed and all of that? He could have been angry because they did not come. He could have been frustrated if they did and they remained silent as the mob and the crowd and the riot grew louder and stronger and more powerful. He could have been frustrated. He could have stopped the whole scene by simply crying out to God, send the angels and 10,000 times 10,000 angels could have come, each of them powerful enough to destroy all of them. But he didn't. And after the scene was over, six hours later, the cross still stood. And when I think about the wondrous cross when I consider what the cross means I consider the words that I should hold on to the words declared from the cross of the cross when Jesus was hung there, Luke recorded the entire scene instead of all of the beatings and the abuse and all of that. Luke recorded it with only four words. 
It says in Luke chapter 23, verse 33, when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. Luke, the physician, who would have paid close attention to the details and the stories that he had heard, but I think it was so gruesome, he refused to write it. There, they crucified him. On that cross, the cross that was still a, a reflection and a reminder in the minds of the disciples and all who would come after it, those of us in this place today, considering that cross, we now use it as a sign of victory. The old rugged cross, that place where my Savior bled and died so that I might have eternal life. There they crucified him. And when they crucified him, Luke records the first word of the, the words that came from the cross, what the cross declares to us even today, to this very moment. It said there, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The first declaration of the cross is the declaration of compassion toward you. Father, forgive them. We've speculated for centuries. Who is them? Who are they that he is asking the Father to forgive? Was it the Roman centurion and, and his garrison who, who led him up the hill, who kept the crowds from getting too close, who drug him up the hill, laid him on his back and drove those spikes into his hands and feet? Father, forgive them. Was that the group he was asking was it the Pharisees who stood in the shadows just a short distance away from the cross and laughed and mocked and said, if that was really the Son of God, seems like he'd come down and save himself. They were mocking him and even blaspheming that he was the Son of God. Was that who he was asking God to forgive? Was it those crowds, that crowd of non-believers who were shouting out curses and, and, and blasphemies and spitting upon the Son of God? Was it those people who had nothing to do with him that he said they, they just don't understand what they're doing? Father, forgive them. Was it the disciples who weren't there or was it the disciples who were there and were silent? It was surely all of those, but may I add one more group to the scene? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, those who attend the New Providence Baptist Church. Forgive them. Thanks be to God that he offered forgiveness. Without his forgiveness, we would have no hope. Thanks be to the great God of eternity who said, Father, forgive them, who gave us the first, the first declaration from the cross, the declaration of compassion toward all of mankind. They've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. They've all failed and they deserve death and punishment and separation, but I don't want to give them that. Instead, I want to give them compassion. I want to give them mercy. I want to give them grace. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. We can condemn those from 2,000 years ago who stood on or near the hill, but we must not forget that we have the book. We have the record. We might be, listen to me, we might be more guilty than they because we have the full revelation and we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And Jesus came to seek and to save all who were lost. That's you and I. He came because we had failed. There was no hope, but he in our hopelessness had compassion on us. The first declaration from the cross is surely compassion. Then in verse 39, we see the second declaration. I call it the declaration of confession. Verse 39, then one of the criminals 
who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But it had said in the previous verse, There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. There were two criminals there. But here in verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. As the scene began, Mark records in chapter 15, 31, Likewise, the chief priest also, making, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Those, not this one, but both of them, as they hung on his right and his left, they too reviled and mocked him. The criminals hanging on the cross. But the second declaration of the cross, not only is there compassion from God toward you, there must be a confession from the cross. Because it goes on to say in that account in verse number 40, but the other, the other criminal, not the one who was cursing and reviling, the other answering rebuked that criminal saying, do you not even fear God? Seeing you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, there's the word, there's the confession. Master, Savior, Lord, I have nothing to offer you. I'm hanging on the cross. I deserve this condemnation. I'm going to be put to death. I have only hours left. But Lord, I know who you are. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That criminal didn't have one thing to offer God. That criminal could have been me. Could have been you. Hanging on that cross with nothing to offer. He didn't even make some pseudo offer. He didn't try to somehow manipulate or, or have some deal bartered with God. He simply said, Lord, you're the master. I know who you are. I know I deserve this and I know you do not. So I confess right now, I need you. I can't get to heaven. Jesus had already said not to him, but to others. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There was no way. There is no other way except Jesus. That criminal didn't know that truth. That criminal, criminal was led by the Spirit of God to confess his sins and cry out, I deserve this punishment just like the guy on the other end does. We deserve it. I don't want it. I'm asking you for favor. We are saved by God's grace through faith, not by our works. That's that criminal never went to Sunday school a single time, never paid a tithe, never blessed an orphan or a widow, never did any of the things that we know as Christians we should do. But he was rescued because of his confession. Every time I see the cross, I consider the compassion my Savior showed to me. And I consider the confession that I must now make because of his deed on the cross. You see, if he was crucified on the cross, if he shed all of his blood, if he paid the price for my sin and yours, but I don't confess that I need that, if I don't confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I cannot inherit the kingdom. I must call on the name of the Lord. There is a confession that we should consider when we see the cross. The great declaration of the cross is his great compassion and his great confession that he requires of us. But there's more. There's more that the cross should remind us. There are people who today are, are offended by the cross They're offended when they see the cross standing in our parking lot. 
There are people who are offended because people wear jewelry or have some love for the cross. I will confess to you that I love that old rugged cross. I love the cross of God because it is what brought, bought my salvation. There is no other way that I could have eternal life. I am a worm and a slug and the worst of all sinners. I don't deserve it, but the cross showed me compassion. And I gave my confession to God knowing and realizing my condition that I had no hope. But Jesus reminds us that the cross is more than just those things. In fact, the cross, when we see it, declares concern for us. Did you know God is concerned about you? He's concerned about your life and your family, your marriage, your job, your education, your food. He is concerned about your clothing and your, the roof over your head. He says, I know the world thinks about those, but I will provide those. He shows concern. In John chapter 19, verse 25, the Bible says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Jesus, after he had been beaten and abused. Most likely at this point, it's within the first hour of him being hung on the cross. His body is bloody. The very muscles and tendons are showing through the epidermis, through his skin where his body has been cut apart. Blood continues to ooze from his body. He is in dreadful, terrible pain. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of his own agony, his own anguish, on top of everything else in the act of crucifixion, those terrible, wicked, vile Romans knew how to really make it hurt when they would crucify someone they didn't stretch them out and pull their body as far as they could and hang them there no no they 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 bent their body as they hung them on the cross they nailed the spikes into the feet with the legs slightly bent and the knees protruding and and the body would be hung there where it would slump even though the, the nails were holding them and the body would, would, would gasp and, and need air and, and because of the very posture of the victim being crucified, they were hanging there and the only way they could breathe, their diaphragm was shut off and the only way they could breathe was to push up against the spike in their feet and that spike, with the nerve endings that were hitting that spike would shoot pain coursing through their body and they would gasp and groan and cry out every time they had to take a breath. Once they would stand and gasp for breath, they would then collapse back on their arms and when they collapsed, their weight fell against their hand, their, their hands and the spikes in their hands and the pain would shoot down their arms into their backbone, up their spine, into their brain and it would over and over and over and over every breath. And in the midst of all of that, as the Savior hung on the cross, I believe he pushed up and gasped. And when he did, there stood his mother, the woman who 33 years earlier had given birth to him in a stable. He never called her mother, by the way, or mom or any titles such as that. But he showed great respect and he showed concern for her. He knew how her heart must be breaking. You mothers who have lost a child, you mothers who have lost some loved one, you men who have lost someone you care about, you know the pain. But when you're hanging on a cross, I'm not exactly sure that I would be thinking about your problems. But the cross 
is different than anything else, anywhere else. And as he looked and saw Mary, he said to her, woman, behold your son. I think Jesus was a good son. Bible said that when he was 12 years old and he came up missing when they went to the temple in Jerusalem, Mary and Joseph came back to get him. And the Bible says that from that time when he went back with them, he obeyed his parents and honored them and grew in favor with both man and God. I believe that Jesus was a good son. And so when this good son was there being paying for her sins, by the way, Mary was not perfect. She was not sinless. She is a human being born of a mother and a father. That means she had to sin, the original sin of Adam in her, cursing, coursing through her veins just as all of us do. And he knew that she needed help like everyone else. And he showed concern. What's going on in your life today? You could replace her name, by the way, with yours. As he raises up and he sees you, he's concerned with you. He's concerned with you. The cross reminds us of his concern. The cross declares the compassion of God. The cross demands the confession of men. And the cross proves the concern that God has for all of us. The cross declares a great cost. Did you know salvation is free to you and I? But before the great salvation could be given, a cost had to be paid. A price had to be paid. It's free to us, but a great cost was made in both Mark chapter 15 and Matthew chapter 27. There's a passage recorded Mark 15, 33. Now, when the sixth hour had come, the sixth hour is noon. 6 a.m. the day began. At 9 a.m., Jesus was crucified. And at the sixth hour, or high noon, There was darkness. Never before had there been darkness like this. In the book of Exodus, there's an accounting of the plagues that God sent on Pharaoh and the Egyptian people. And the Bible says in the ninth plague that he brought darkness on the land. For three days, there was darkness over all of Egypt. So much darkness, they couldn't see to go in or out. It was constant darkness for three days. But in the land of Goshen, in the northern part of Egypt, there was light where the Israelites lived. God will always bring light to his people. But this darkness, the Bible records in the book of Exodus, was so dark that they could feel it. They could feel the darkness squeezing in, closing in upon them. They, they, they not only couldn't see anything, but they could feel this, this unseen, unknown darkness of the soul like some of you have had, like some of you are dealing with today, a darkness of your soul that you can't explain visited with someone recently who was talking about the COVID virus in this last year. And the darkness has tried its best to hide the light in the last year. I've been discouraged. You've been discouraged? This person that I was talking to said they had. So I, I just, I, I just, there's just a depression. It just feels so dark feels so dark not looks so dark it feels it's it's more than sight when the sixth hour had come there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour not like an eclipse 
A couple of years ago, there was a solar eclipse that, that came right over us. Y'all remember? That eclipse, they, they, they tracked it. They said, well, one of the best places in all, the, all of America is Sweetwater, Tennessee. And that, that, that moon somehow crossed between the, the sun and the earth. And it was, the moon is much, much, much smaller, but it's much, much, much closer. So it came and it just blotted out the sun. One of just a couple of total solar eclipses I've ever seen or known about. And I remember I was standing at the cross. I have photographs of the, the moon blocked, blocking out the sun. And instantly there was a coolness. My guess is the temperature, temperature changed 10 degrees in an instant. It was the strangest sensation I'd ever had. Standing there seeing them, but it didn't last but a moment. The, the, the earth was moving, the moon was moving, we were in orbit, things were changing, the sun was the only constant. Everything else seemed to be moving and when it did, for a moment darkness came and it was a strange feeling. Birds made different sounds. Crickets and katydids started making noises. It was the oddest thing, but then it was gone. Here in this scripture, for three hours the darkness came. We, we don't know what, there's no such eclipse as this. The moon won't stop traveling or as the earth spins, the moon continue to stay in between. It can't happen that way. It was a supernatural act of God. That's what happened. I don't know how to explain it otherwise. I don't have to explain it. If you have to have an explanation, you need to talk to God about that. Supernatural, it's an act of the hand of God. It was magnificent thought. Except it wasn't because when that darkness came, like what happened here, Miss Kim and I were standing beneath the cross when it happened and neither of us could even speak. Strange. It just took our, there were no words for that. For three hours, there was silence. For three hours, there was darkness. The people stopped their mocking. They stopped all of those, those things and accusations. I think they stopped moving. I think they just stood there trying to, to see what they could see. Maybe someone quickly lit a torch so they could see that the Christ and the criminals were still on the cross. They were trying to experience this thing, what was going on, what had happened. Supernaturally, God Almighty, God himself turned off the sun. He just turned it off. Before that time, for thousands of years, in the created history, the, the history of the Bible that we have 6,000 years worth of recorded history, the, God himself created the, the heavens and the earth. He created the sun to, to rule by day, the moon by night, and every single day the sun would shine as the earth would rotate and it would look like the sun was rising on, on our horizon. We know that it was the earth moving, but it was always there and every day the sun would shine every single day until this day. I think for the past 33 years, immediately preceding this, the sun would, would kind of smile knowing that it had been created by God himself and all things that were created by God were created by the hand of Jesus. Jesus was the creator of the sun. And I think the sun loved it when the son of God came to earth. When he lived on planet earth, every, every day as the earth would turn, I think the sun was looking for that place, the, the holy land. It was looking for that horizon to come up and see the, the land that Jesus lived in just to see what his master, what his creator was going to do that day. I don't know that we can personify the sun like that, but, but I do believe that all of creation knows who God is. I believe that, they, that the creation rejoices or the creation weeps at the thought of the things of God. And I believe at that moment, for some reason, God said to the sun, turn out the light. I, I believe that I know why. See, God is perfect and pure and holy and righteous. God cannot dwell in the presence of sin. Sin cannot dwell in the presence of God. And at that moment, three hours on the cross, at that moment, Jesus had experienced the previous night something called the cup in the Garden of Gethsemane. The cup is the, the sin of the world. It's my sin and yours. And that's just about enough. But then we got to add yours and yours and yours, even his. 
And all of that sin becomes this terrible blackness, this awful, gruesome thought. And I think that cup was poured on Jesus. The one who knew no sin, who had never sinned in his life, became sin. He became sin. I think that the sin of the world was poured on him at that moment. And the perfect, holy, and righteous God cannot look on sin. So he said to his angels, 10,000 times 10,000, remember that 100 million I talked about recently? All of those angels who were watching from heaven saw those soldiers beat the Son of God, saw the scourging, the whipping, the mocking, the, the, all the, the abuse that he had taken, and they said to the Father, may we go, sir? And just one of those angels could have destroyed it all. Can we go now? Can we, can we stop this? Oh God, what's going on? What are they doing? And I think at that moment, three hours in, at 12 o'clock noon, when darkness fell, I think darkness blotted out the sun and God said to the angels, you cannot go, you must now turn your backs. And every angel, the messengers and servants of Almighty God did just that. They turned their back one at a time in perfect unity, all turning away from the cross and from Jesus and Jesus felt their eyes come off him up until that time. He had had communion with the Father and the angels. They'd come to minister to him and serve him. But then was the worst moment when the cost was the highest. From the, before the beginning of time until after time will end and forever and ever eternally in both directions, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have been one. They've been together in unity, in harmony, in cooperation. But Jesus was at that moment receiving the sins of the world. And I just explained to you, God cannot look upon sin. So I think even God Almighty, the Father in heaven, turned his back away from the cross. Even though the plan was theirs, they had put it in place. He knew what would happen. I think the father's heart was absolutely crushed and broken when he had to turn his back on his son. And in that moment, for the first time in the history of the world and the only time that it will ever occur, the father and the son broke fellowship because your sin was poured on the son. Your sin overwhelmed him and God could not look at that. At that moment, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lema sebakthani. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Where are you? God, Father, where art thou? And the darkness remained for three hours, three long eternal hours that the Father's back was turned on his son and his son was experiencing the sin of the world. And he was doing all of that because he wanted you to someday live in heaven. And there was no other way. So he accepted the sin of the world at great cost to him. When Jesus came to earth to Bethlehem 33 years before this moment, when Jesus came to earth, he had to take off his deity. He had to remove the, the glory that he held as the only begotten of the Father on the throne of eternity. He had to take off, I believe, his Shekinah glory. That is the glory of God that shines from within to all the world. God, Jesus, had to take off that Shekinah glory. I propose that when he took off his Shekinah glory, this brilliant light that couldn't be seen forever and ever, I think he hung it in space and it became the Bethlehem star. I know there are other uh, things that, that folks who study the stars say there was an alignment of planets and all that. You see say whatever you want, I'll believe what I have faith to believe. I think that Jesus had to leave his Shekinah glory in heaven. It's interesting that as he left heaven to come to earth, he set up a new light. As he left earth to go back to heaven, he closed off an old light, just a curiosity. There was a great cost. The cross should always declare to us the cost 
that was paid, the price that was paid for your eternity. Every time you look at the cross, you need to consider the declarations, what God is declaring, that there is compassion for you. There is confession demanded of you. There is concern for you. And there was a cost that was paid on your behalf. The cross also declares creation. Stay with me for just a moment. John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Every week with multiple services, I go between the services after the first service, before the second. I go out to my um, truck or, or if I brought it in already, I go into one of the classrooms and I carry in a big jug of Gatorade every week. It, preaching wears me out. I don't know about you other preachers, but you get all I got just kind of poured out. So I go get Gatorade and, and go to a classroom and hide and re, kind of uh, um, replenish the electrolytes and all of that stuff. And I'm just praying, God, help me. Help me to preach exactly the way you want. These, this series, Brother Daniel has been in both services every Sunday for this Easter series. And I asked him last Sunday, I said, <clears throat> man, I just realized you're in both of these. I'm sorry that you're having to listen to the message twice. He said, no, I'm really enjoying it. And I said, well, Kim says she can't even tell it's the same message hardly. God kind of stirs me and I've studied and there's so much kind of jammed in here and I just pop the cork and stuff starts flying out. I don't know exactly what's going to come out at which time. But I know this, I'm exhausted and I thirst. And that's the human side of me. Our body's made up of mostly water. We need several glasses of water every single day to be healthy. All that's humanity. That's part of God's creation. From the beginning, that's how he created human beings. And when he came to earth and, and dwelt among us, when he tabernacled with us, he, the, this, this God of, of eternity put on human flesh. And so he honored creation. The cross reminds us that he honors creation. And not only did he thirst at that moment, he thir and, and it said a vessel full of food, sour wine was sitting there. They filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it in his mouth. And I thought, well, where were the disciples? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll, you'll, be my, you'll obey my commandments and you'll serve me and you'll love me. Our, our partnership to, to Venezuela speaks about a cup of cold water in Jesus' name ministering to the least of these. Where were his disciples? Why didn't somebody bring him a cup of water? But no, they instead, you say, well, the Romans were, were there and they were, they were crucifying him. That, that person might get in trouble. It's time somebody gets in trouble for God. It's time we stand up. I thirst. And they dipped a sponge in sour vinegar and stuck it to his lips. The same God who created all of creation. Thousands of years ago, I believe in, in um, creation that is recorded, I think that the Bible tells it exactly as it is. I think it took six days, not six time periods of a thousand years or a million years or we're 50 billion years old. You're dreaming. You're, you're, you're struggling with more faith than I have to think that. <clears throat> but when God created the heavens and the earth, he created the earth. And with the earth hanging there in space with no strings, that's kind of cool that it stays right where he put it. But then when he did, he placed an envelope called the atmosphere around it, right? Everybody know about that? And it's kind of a terrarium. And it's enclosed. And inside that atmosphere is everything that we need. 
there is enough rain to fall and water the earth and inside of that. And when the rain comes to the earth and, and then it, the heat, uh, the sun shines and heats it up, it evaporates and goes into the sky and the, the, the rain, the, the moisture comes into the sky and humidity and it comes together as clouds and recycles and rains again. Did you know that all the rain that has ever come is out there today? It's still here and all of the water that's on the planet has been here and it's just kind of being recycled. Last night, last night as we were praying, I walked out, Dave, you, you know we were standing out there on the porch. We prayed and we, we made the comment, it, the, the ceiling didn't crack and pop last night like it normally does if you've been here at night. It was just quiet and rain was coming. We knew it. We heard some thunder roll. And just when we said amen, got ready to go out, it just opened up. I'm telling you, the sky opened up. And as we walked outside, Dave and I just stood on the porch for a few minutes, talking, chatting for just a minute. And I said, do you, I said, you see that raindrop right there? That thing has fallen before. It may have fallen, got in the jet stream. You know, the jet stream is the wind up in the upper atmosphere that blows stuff all around the planet. So that raindrop that fell last night may have 2,000 years ago fallen on the head of Jesus. I just got plum excited talking to him and I held my hand out underneath the canopy and a raindrop hit me. I said, look, David, this may, this one right here may have landed on Paul or maybe Jesus himself. When I said that and it struck me, I slapped myself right in the head with it because if it's been on Jesus, I want it on me. All of creation. When you look at the cross, you need to understand that God honors his plan he coordinates everything that is. He brings it all together and he declares even his creation. He declares that we are humans. He created us this way. We are his children and he loves us. The cross declares compassion, confession, concern, cost, creation. But don't forget this one. John chapter 19, verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. The cross declares completion. You don't need anything else. You don't need someone else. You don't need some other religion to add to this. You don't need some amount of works to do this. The criminal who hung on the cross and saw Jesus later that day in paradise, that same criminal did not do anything. Nothing can be added to salvation. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, so that none of us can boast of it. We are saved by the work of Jesus Christ that he completed on the cross. When you see the cross and you see that Jesus is no longer hanging there, you need to be reminded that it is finished. He completed all the work that God had assigned for him. He did everything that was required for that moment, for that very moment. It is completed. The cross cries out to us, declaring to us, the work is completed. All we need to do is receive it. And finally, the last word I want you to be considering that the cross declares to us is the word control. Control. This morning, as I was reading over my sermon last night, and you, most of you know, I don't sleep on Saturday nights. I just can't. I typically get about two hours of sleep, maybe three, because <clears throat> I'm so excited to come and preach, and I'm anxious. I'm reading sermons. I'm going and looking at other things. And so God just, just um, I just love to preach the gospel. So I go home then, eat lunch real quick, and just conk out. I just crash. If I don't return your calls on Sunday afternoon, forgive me, I'm unconscious. I've just dumped everything, drunk a gallon of Gatorade and ate a bite and I've crashed. <clears throat> Last night, I'd gone to bed about four o'clock, finally got in bed. Laid down for, for just a little while, about five or 5.30, just, just my eyes popped open and I thought, wrong word. I had the word contentment at the end of this. I'd used that word before, in fact, about this passage, but it was not really about contentment. The Lord said, no, I don't want you to speak about contentment. I want you to tell the congregation, tell the world on YouTube and Facebook Live, I'm in control. My name is Jehovah God, and I'm in control. 
I had already sent the message, the sermon outline to the guys so they could get them up on the screen for you and get it to the internet and all that. So I sent another message this morning. <clears throat> After I, I thought, okay, Lord, if I remember this, if I wake up in a couple hours and I still, it's still on my heart, I know it's from you. I fell back asleep. Thunder rolls me out of bed in just about an hour after that. Get up and said, okay, well, I got to get in the shower. I do that. And I'm thinking, okay, God said he's in control. So I went and typed a, a, another email to the guys. I said, hey, hope you get this. If you don't, I'll explain it. <clears throat> I'm content. The cross should bring contentment to our heart. But the cross should, first of all, remind us that God's in control. He is absolutely in control. Listen to how I know that. It says in Luke 23, 44. Now it was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Pastor Gary shared that with us last Sunday night. That veil is a, is a beautiful image. The veil also, I was reading this week something following up on that. The veil was stood in the temple, I'm sorry, in the tabernacle through the wilderness wandering. Then in the temple, when they built it in Jerusalem, even when the temple was destroyed, the veil was still available. They brought it back. They, they restored it into the, tem, into the temple worship services. So the veil itself was about 1,500 years old. I sometimes gripe because I got an old pair of shoes or something. 1,500 years that temple veil had hung. Pastor Gary described it last week that said two, said two teams of oxen couldn't be chained to that thing and them strong as an ox, strong as teams of oxen couldn't tear it apart, couldn't rip that thing. It was as broad as a man's hand, more than four inches thick. This, this curtain, that, that curtain up there is a, is a 16th of an inch thick. This thing was four inches thick. It was enormous. It was spectacular. And that temple veil was hanging there. And as it hung, it was torn in two from the top to the bottom. As Pastor Gary so eloquently preached last week and reminded us, it was giving us access to God himself. That was what opened up the, the door, the, the curtain pulled back so that we could see God, when Jesus had, had hung on the cross through those three hours, six hours total, he was finally cried out, he was thirsty. Then he said, it's finished. I've done everything that God's told me to do. When Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. When he cried that out, he then said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You, you didn't get that. The Roman soldiers did not kill Jesus. The Pharisees did not kill Jesus. Jesus said, I'm laying down my life so I can again pick it up. I commit my spirit. Nobody's taking my life from me. Jesus gave his life so that we might have this hope. It was interesting in that whole passage Having said this, he breathed his last. Luke records it, the next verse. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. The whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all the acquaintances and all the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Another passage says that when, when the temple veil was torn, there was an earthquake the very earth shook, graves opened up, rocks broke open. I say that to say this. Do you remember our conversation 45 minutes ago? When Jesus came into Jerusalem five days earlier, he came in riding on a donkey. The people from Galilee were with him. The people from Jerusalem came out to meet him and they were all shouting, Hosanna to the king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. This is the Messiah. And the people were shouting and singing and the Pharisees in the crowd so it said to Jesus, Jesus, you must tell your disciples to be silent. They cannot say that. And Jesus said, if they were to remain silent, immediately the rock would cry out. Now when that earthquake, you know what happened? You, you ever 
Have you ever heard the sound of rocks breaking, the clapping and the screeching and the whistling of the power and the pressure, all that? When Jesus, God is in control. On the cross, he demanded, he whispered from heaven, my son has just completed it. The people are silent. Nobody's saying a word. Nobody's rejoicing. Rocks, cue up the music. (laughs) And the rocks began to cry out. God is in control of the rocks. Y'all, we need to understand the cross declares that he is in control of everything. I know it's been a hard year. I have longed for this week, for Passion Week, for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, to be with you and to gather together as a church family. I've longed for this. It's been hard on me. I've been discouraged. But hallelujah, I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord so that I could lift up the name of Jesus and remind us that the cross declares a message. Whether or not we've got preachers standing in pulpits preaching the gospel, whether or not we have folks going door to door, whether or not we have anybody that will read the Bible, as long as there is a cross, the message is being declared. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. The cross is still declaring to us today a message of hope and eternity. Have you received that message yet? Have you personally said, man, I, I just, I, I didn't realize that. Those words that I just read was, were every single word that was said from the cross. Every word Jesus spoke, I just read to you. And I believe those words still ring out today. I think they're real. I think they're for each of us. God is speaking to you, calling to you, begging you, come to me. I've shown you compassion. I've been long-suffering and let the world spin one more day so you could make this decision. I've shown concern for you. You must bring a confession to me. There's a great cost that was prayed, that was paid. My son and I broke fellowship for a season just for you. Just for you, because of your sin, you forced us to break fellowship. But I was in control of all of creation through all of that. Concerned for each of you, come to me. Come to Jesus. Come. They took Jesus' body from the cross after he gave up his last breath and he committed his own spirit to the Father. No one took him. He gave himself for you and I. Have you received the gift? Confession needs to be made. We need to confess to God that I've sinned. I've come short of the glory. I'm the one who brought the darkness. Don't blame someone else. Don't blame the Romans, the Greeks. Don't blame the Jews. Don't blame the Pharisees and and scribes and priests. You did it. It was your sin. It was my sin. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He came to seek and to save all who were lost. We've all failed in sin and come short of his glory. He loves you anyway. He proved his love now while, while we were still sinners. He died on the cross just for you. Do something with that. God's done everything he can. He begs you. His spirit draws you and pulls at you and tugs at your heart. He wants you to come to him. Will you come? This morning in quick invitation verse, I'm going to invite you to come here. If you're online with us, thank you. I ask you to respond right now. Bear with us. Stay with us. The choir is going to come in just a moment and conclude the service. But before they do that, we're going to give a verse of invitation for any of you to come. I'm going to move this podium out of the way because I don't want anything to be between you and the cross. I want each of us to have direct and immediate access to the cross and all of the declarations that it makes come to Jesus. By the way, as you can see, he's not on the cross. By the time of this message is completed, he's been taken down, his body cleaned and wrapped with linen cloths and carried to a nearby grave, a tomb that was cut out of a stone. Another stone rolled over the face of that stone and they sealed it up so that, that in that moment, Satan thought he had won. He thought that death had come. He had killed the son of God. But I encourage you, I beg you, I'll, I'll, I'll plead with you, come back next Sunday because I promise you Sundays are coming. <laughs> But even before you get there, 
listen to the declaration of the cross. Is that speaking to you today? The compassion that God has for you? The confession that he's calling from you? The concern? The cost? Would you come right here and right now? Come to Jesus. Father, I pray that you will speak to us. Just speak to us. Let us hear your voice clearly and plainly, powerfully. Let us respond to you, every man, woman, boy, and girl. Lord, with no, no words being sung, just some music played for a moment, I'm asking anyone who has heard from you today to respond to you. Last Sunday was the first Sunday in more than a year that the altar was full. Folks just came. The Spirit was drawing and pulling and they just may today be that day because the cross is calling us. There's a declaration being made for all of us today. May we just surrender our lives and come to you all around this place. May every man, woman, boy, and girl just come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to be here for just a moment, and I invite you to come. You don't even have to stand this morning, but if God's speaking to you, just make your way out. I'll greet you and pray with you and help you with anything that you might need. Then after this moment of invitation, the choir is going to sing. While they sing three, about three songs, they're all also invitation songs. So the invitation is way longer than normal. But I encourage you, don't miss it. Come quickly. Come quickly. Right now, all around this place, if God's speaking to your heart, come to the cross. God loves you. If you need to be saved, come. Even as the choir sings, they're not trying to entertain you. They're allowing the Spirit of God to work through them. You come. God's called you. If you need to be saved, come. If you need to join the church, come. Don't be distracted. Be encouraged to come. Oh, how He loves you.
last I lay Stand with us as we sing this final song. If God's speaking to you, I still encourage you to come. Come to Jesus. Oh, how he loves you. What is the need in your heart today?
cross for you. message of the cross. Thank you for the declarations that it brings to us every single day. If you've been with us today on, on the internet through Facebook Live or YouTube, thank you so much. Please let us know. Send us a message. Let us know that you're with us. We love you so much and are thankful for you doing that. Tonight we have a very special service. We're going to have our Lord's Supper service at 6 p.m. Normally when we, we, have, uh, we don't have this coronavirus to deal with. We would have services meet most every night this week and do some other things, but we're changing it around just a bit. But tonight we have a testimonial service and then the Lord's Supper. I encourage you, if you're online, you still have time. If you'll send us a message on Facebook or a text or a phone call, we will deliver those uh, little cups to you so you can join us online for that service. We've got folks that are willing to do that through the day. I'll probably be asleep and not able to, but somebody will get them to you at your house so you can celebrate with us tonight at 6 o'clock, all right? Then this week, we've got activities going on uh, all week, different things. We're going to be around the church property every evening this week. If you're available to come and help us uh, do stuff like shovel mulch, we would love to have you do that. We want the services to be beautiful for this coming Sunday, sunrise service at 7 a.m., this coming Sunday morning. With that, we're going to have a biscuit breakfast. We've typically done big sit-down breakfast. This is going to be a little bit smaller, but uh, biscuits and coffee and orange juice are available for everyone who wants to be here with us Sunday morning, 7 a.m., okay? So that's the kind of the week's activities. Thank you so much. Also on Thursday, I forgot about this one, Thursday, we're delivering, um, uh, I think, uh, like 80 dozen donuts to the schools. We're delivering them as well as a devotional and a prayer card to all of the faculty members. We're going to do that Thursday morning meeting here at the church at 7. We want to deliver them to the schools by 7.30. We need a couple more people who are willing to do that. There's only so many hands and I can only drive so fast or Jason will pull me over. So we need help. If you're willing to join us this coming Thursday morning to deliver to the schools just a, several dozen boxes to each of our 12 schools, okay? That's our probably be our final Bless the School event of the year, so I encourage you to join us with that. Also, don't forget, we're going to exit this way in just a moment. The offering chest is there. If you're online, you can do, do your offering online or mail it, bring it by, any of those things, and we're just so thankful for you. Passion Week is a good week. All week, I want you to be thinking about what God has done, what the cross means, the messages that it declares to all of us. Uh, may we think about our great God. I love you. Thank you for being here today. Did I get all the announcements? Get them as far as we know. All right. Thank you, guys. Heavenly Father, give us a great day. And I promise you, Lord, I'm going to try my best to give you my greatest praise. You are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God's blessings upon you. Thank